And okay, we're off. So the, the principal thing you need to make uh, an MR image is a very large static magnetic field. And um, that is provided by uh, a magnet which is always on. You can't, you don't turn this off when you leave for the day. Right? Uh, and the field strength inside this tube, so it's a cylindrical tube like many imaging systems, the field strength inside this tube is many, many times larger, say, than the field of, of the magnetic field that you're bathed in from the Earth's magnetic field. You know, it's about 10,000 times larger uh, than that field. Um, the way a magnetic field of that size is created is there are coils around the patient and they're continu contiguous coils and in those coils you're running current right uh, elect you know electric current and the coils themselves are bathed usually in liquid helium to keep them superconducting and so there's no resistance so once you get the the material into the superconducting state you can just ramp the current up higher and higher and higher until finally you have a huge amount of current and you step back and just let it roll and it's, uh, it, it basically will stay that way forever. So you have a static magnetic field provided by these superconducting coils and it's 10,000 times the Earth's field. That, and we'll see, that creates uh, the conditions in which you can make this transition of energy in a spin one-half particle. You know, once you have that magnetic field there, the um, you know it provides the basic uh, sort of technical requirement to do NMR, but it also provides probably the the highest risk component of this procedure. And the reason it's high risk is because any metallic object really has huge forces on it uh, when you bring it close to this magnet. So if, and I've seen this happen, if you bring a floor cleaner up to here and you're polishing the floor and you get the floor cleaner to about this position, it lifts off the floor and you will not be able to hold that thing. It just rolls in here at about 50 miles an hour and smashes into the, into the magnet. And um, oxygen bottles also do the same thing. They become remarkable projectiles. Right? If they're sitting on a patient bed and you bring the bed in here, the bottle will fly off the bed and fly into the magnet. Uh, so fatalities from metallic objects in this magnetic field probably number about a half dozen in, in this field, the ones that are reported anyway. I'm sure they're all reported. Um, bef in the early days of MR, you had to have an x-ray screening exam before you went in the scanner in order to test whether or not you had any surgical clips, for instance, from a previous aneurysm surgery, because those clips back then were made of stainless steel, which is ferromagnetic. And so if you walk into this high magnetic field with a surgical clip in your brain, you can imagine there's a high torque on that clip, and it causes a great deal of damage. Right? And so some people died that way. Um, but now all of medicine is, is essentially uh, compensating for the fact that most people will have an MR at some point in their life. And so all surgical clips are not for a magnetic. In fact, cardiac pacemakers now are made such that they're compatible with going into MR scanners. Right? And, um, and so that's uh, how it's affected cardiology. One one of the problems with doing cardiac MR is the fact that uh, you, up until about a year ago, you really it was a contraindication to have an MR to have a pacemaker or a defibrillator. And so, if you had one of those devices, you couldn't go in the magnet. Uh, studies at Johns Hopkins and other places showed that at 1.5 tesla, which is the most common field, you can actually just turn the pacing device off if the patient is not pacemaker dependent, uh, you can scan them with the device off and, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, the patient's fine. 
sometimes a, very rarely will something occur. So most places now um, are moving towards being able to scan patients that have devices, although it takes some special staffing and special um, conditions. So here we have the magnet. This is a really big magnet. Uh, most magnets are smaller than this one. This one, you know, the size of this magnet would tell me it's probably a seven Tesla magnet, which is a really large field strength. Most MR machines are set at 1.5 Tesla. Um, the other components are, of course, the patient table for precise movement of where the patient is in the device. Uh, and also, there are a set of coils wrapped around. They're inside the magnet coils, and they're wrapped around the cylinder, and they're called gradient coils. And they will change the magnetic field as a function of position inside here. So the gradient coil is used to make the magnetic field larger on one side and smaller on the other in three directions. So in X, Y, and in Z. Okay. So you have three separate gradient coils. And then there's a radio frequency coil which is inside the gradient coil and that's just an RF antenna. And the RF antenna is, uh, unlike the antenna that's on the top of, of a hill and broadcasts to a city, and when you look at that antenna with your receiver, what you model is hitting your antenna is a plane wave of radio frequency, you know, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, here, you are very close to the antenna. You're right up against the antenna. And so they, there's a, a large difference in the phase and the amplitude of the radio frequency energy as a function of position in there. Not only that, the power of radio frequency energy that you are transmitting into the person is quite high uh, compared to the radio frequency you would get just standing next to a transmission, you know, a radio uh, transmission station, um, or the amplitude of the radio frequency coming out of your telephone, for instance. Okay, so here's a, a rogues gallery of magnets. Uh, this is a standard clinical magnet you can buy for probably around $2 million these days. Uh, for something like this. Depends how you kitty it up and where it was built. Uh, if it was built in China, it would be about $750,000. If it's built in Milwaukee, it's about $2 million, something like that. That's, that's how the market plays out. Uh, this is a seven Tesla magnet, which is a very large magnet. There weren't many of these um, until quite recently. And uh, you can buy these as a commercial device now. Uh, at 7 Tesla, and they're mostly used for imaging the brain uh, because they provide super high resolution images. Very difficult to image the heart on a 7 Tesla magnet because the radio frequency energy you use, the frequency increases as the field strength goes up, and the attenuation of that radio frequency increases in the body as well. And so getting that into the heart is difficult. And then uh, there are these one off magnets that are around the world. Uh, here's one that's almost 12 Tesla at the NIH, and here's one in France about 12 Tesla. And these are used for very specialized imaging, mostly in the brain, mostly to look at um, high resolution structures in the brain and diffusion of, of water and things like that in the brain. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is remarkably small compared to the field that that we see here. So when you when you use a compass, uh, it has a sort of magnetized little needle inside there, and it will line up with the Earth's field, as you know. Played with that as a kid, and um, that field is strong enough to you know move that little piece of, of metal. Um, one Tesla. So remember, I said the the standard magnetic field in imaging is 1.5 Tesla. Or, 15,000 Gauss, and the Earth's field is a half a Gauss. It, it, the Earth's field changes depending where you are on the Earth, but uh, I think around where we are, it's about half a Gauss. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I stand corrected. The 1.5 Tesla is 30,000 times the Earth's field, right? That's why uh, you get these remarkable forces on metallic objects. 
we're going to use uh, radio frequency energy uh, to elicit a, a signal from the patient. And if we just think about water for a second, say we put a jar of water in this magnet and it's just made of you know, protons from the hydrogen and then there's oxygen atoms there as well. But we'll just think about the protons from the hydrogen. It turns out that the, the protons from the hydrogen will absorb the radio frequency energy at a particular frequency depending on the magnetic field that they're in. And um, a proton, is, it's a spin one half particle and when you put it in a magnetic field it can be in, quantum mechanically, it can be in two states inside that field with respect to its nuclear spin, which is one half. It can be in the down state or the low energy state or the up state and the high energy state. And if you irradiate that bath of protons or water with photons or radio frequency energy that is equivalent or very close to the transition from the low energy to the high energy state, you will see a remarkable amount of radiation gets absorbed by your sample. So if you sweep across the frequencies, right, when you sweep through the frequency that gives you photons of the energy between the low and the high state, you will see an absorption of, of your energy that you're putting into the sample. And that was originally observed in the 40s or something, maybe the 30s it was first observed, and then it was explained uh, uh, by uh, two independent labs, and it's called magnetic resonance, and nuclear magnetic resonance, and it, it depends on the, the proton, or the spin one-half particle, and every nucleon has a spin, and, um, and so you can do it in different nuclei. Uh, at four protons, uh, for a 1.5 Tesla magnet, the frequency, the resonant frequency where you see that absorption is about 64 megahertz. Okay, so 64 megahertz, you know, uh, so for instance, KPBS is 89.5 megahertz. You know, on your radio dial, if you're looking around, it's 89 megahertz. So it's just below your FM radio dial. It's a 64 megahertz band. Uh, this obviously causes a problem being in an RF band. If you were just to put an MR scanner in this room and start taking images, you would see radio frequency noise on your pictures. So you need to actually do this imaging inside a Faraday cage. And a Faraday cage is a copper box that when you close the door and you seal up the perimeter of the door, you close everything, it is one single conducting box that's grounded in one single place. So that box is sitting in space, and if any radio frequency energy hits the box, the, the current on the surface of the box goes straight to ground, and so you don't see that radio frequency energy inside the box. It's called a Faraday cage. So when you go inside a Faraday cage, you close the door, you do not have cell phone reception. You can't transmit out of the room, right, because it's just it's stopped by the, the copper box. And so in order to, to make these pictures, you know, you, you basically have to do it inside a Faraday cage. It adds expense to making a room in a hospital that you do MRI. Right? Somebody has to come in and make that Faraday cage. And uh, so <clears throat> the signal, interestingly enough, is created by a sort of uh, stimulated emission process where you irradiate the sample or the patient and it's principally the protons we're looking at here because this is the resonant frequency we're going to look at in medical imaging most of the time. Uh, so we irradiate at the resonant frequency for a specific amount of time with a specific intensity of radio frequency energy. And that's usually about a millisecond, you know, and there's many, many kilowatts of power that's uh, created for that millisecond. Then you shut off your transmitter and you listen at that same frequency. And what you see is an emission of radio frequency energy from the patient at 64 megahertz. And so now the patient, just as we saw with our SPECT or PET imaging, the patient becomes the source 
of the radiation. In that case, there were photons that were really high energy. These are super low energy photons down in the radio frequency band. But the patient is now the source of the uh, imaging. It's not essentially a, a shadowgram the way we did with x-ray and CT of what's stopping the x-rays. We now have a source of radio frequency energy, which is the patient. Okay? And so if there's highly dense material, let's say blood in the left ventricle, you will get a lot of signal right from there because you've got a lot of protons there. In the lung, you won't see a lot of signal because you don't have a lot of protons. So there's just that intensity factor that gives you the ability to image the difference between tissues. And um, we'll see also there's, there are some special properties of the signal, which are the rate at which the signal decays. So it doesn't, it doesn't last forever. It decays exponentially. It's like ringing a bell and also the rate at which it's ready to give you another emission. You know, uh, so you can't, we'll, we'll look at it in terms of how often can you basically stimulate signal from the patient. If you stimulate it with delta T shorter and shorter and shorter, eventually the amount of signal decreases away and we'll look at that. So the radio frequency energy is picked up this is, a, this is called a cage or a bird cage coil, and you transmit radio frequency into the patient with it, and then you can shut it off and put it in receiver mode and receive radio frequency energy with this same coil. Uh, it's many orders of magnitude different, the amplitude of the current in the coil in the transmit and receive mode. So you need to actually blank out all of your receivers when you're transmitting because you don't want to blow them up, right? Because they're, they have preamps and everything that are looking for very small uh, voltages, microvolts. And so we transmit the RF and then we uh, shut off the transmit mode and then we listen for the RF coming back. The coil can be wrapped around the patient like this. Uh, in this case, you have two coils. You have a transmitter which is inside the machine and then the receiver coil is wrapped around the patient and it's in close proximity to the patient which increases the signal to noise a lot. And so this is a typical coil for looking at the torso. If we made it a little bit shorter than this and we pushed it up a little bit it would be a cardiac coil. So normally when you're doing cardiac MRI you strap a cardiac coil around the patient and it's in close proximity to their heart. Some other types of coils that are used for, in this case, these are all head coils. Um, you know, there's a, a receiver coil uh, contained inside this box here, and this shows a home-built receiver coil uh, from Larry Wald at, at uh, MGH, uh, in which you can see individual elements are circles, so they're little rings, and each ring is a separate coil that goes to its own preamp and then signal comes out of that. And so you have this whole collection of coils wrapped around the patient's head. And we won't go into the benefits of doing many small coils versus one large coil, but the benefits are signal to noise, essentially. And therefore you can image faster uh, and um, or have higher resolution pictures. This is what the gradient coil looks like. Remember, uh, out just outside this coil, at a higher, slightly higher radius, is the magnetic, is the coil creating the magnetic field, and then we get to the gradient coil. There are three of these coils, and they're organized to create changes in the magnetic field in three orthogonal directions. Uh, this coil that we're looking at here looks like a, uh, an X or a Y coil, so it changes the magnetic field across the diameter of the cylinder. And the way that is done is you pulse current through these current pathways here, and that current, when it's running through these coils, will change the magnetic field inside the cylinder. And the fundamental organization of those 
uh, coils is we have two rings here, which would create a Z gradient. The gold coil here creates a, y, a, a gradient in Y, and the red coil here creates a gradient in X. And the business end of these two X and Y coils are the end down here in the imaging volume. This is just a return path. And so this creates gradients out here, but they're not gradients you use to image. You're really concerned with what's happening inside your imaging volume. And so the return paths for the current are far away from the imaging volume as you don't really want these to interfere with your imaging. So the gradients themselves are hooked up to amplifiers. Uh, these amplifiers produce large currents in these wires and the large currents drive the current through the coil and create the magnetic field gradient or the change in magnetic field across the sample. These gradient amplifiers have become bigger and bigger and bigger because people would like to use larger gradients to image and they would like to switch those gradients on and off as quickly as possible. And so that creates the need for very high power, excuse me, amplifiers. And uh, this is a, a slide from Tom Liu, who you know, has a lab just down the, the way here, uh, showing that this stack of amplifiers here is a one megawatt gradient amplifier, which, you know, still, I've been doing MR for a while. That's a lot. Of, that's a powerful amplifier. Um, and it's to create a very short rise time and a very high amplitude. And so the, here we're, we're looking at 250 microseconds to get the gradient up to its maximum uh, value, which is a very short uh, period of time. And Tom has put on here that uh, in comparison, Metallica 2017 in their world tour, if you added up the amplifiers used for the audio in that show, it came to you know, 367 kilowatts. This thing is three times more than that, right? So there's a lot of, art, of audio power happening here. And these are usually audio amps because these, these kind of rise times and frequencies of switching these off and on are kind of in the audio range. And so the first amplifiers that were used in MR were straight up audio amps that rock bands used to use in their show. They just like put three of them in a rack and drive your gradients with, with those amplifiers. But now they're custom built for MR. So the, again, this is the, another picture of the orientation of these uh, gradient coils in, on the cylinder, wrapped on the cylinder. And uh, these are the current paths. So the current runs along like this, and this one runs along like this here, along like this, and this one. And it creates a change in the magnetic field in Z, right, as you move in X, right? And it should be ideally independent of your Y position, the magnetic field changing in, in you know, the Z magnetic field changing as a function of X. You just rotate that 90 degrees to get your Y gradient, and then the Z gradient is a fairly simple counterwound uh, uh, set of coils. And so, you can imagine that if I have a current going this way in this coil, by the right-hand rule, I have a magnetic field generated with the arrow pointing up from the coil like this, right? So I would have a slightly increased magnetic field at the center of this loop in my magnet. So let's say the magnet starts at 1.5 Tesla. And that's the field everywhere, and I have no current in these coils yet. When I pulse current in this coil, I add a small amount of magnetic field right here. All right, so it's 1.5 Tesla plus whatever I'm adding with this coil. If I take the current in this coil and I push it through in the opposite direction, right, then the magnetic field goes against the Z direction, and then I have a slightly lower field at this point. Thus, I've created a gradient in Z, higher here, lower here. And ideally, it changes as a linear ramp 
as I go across my imaging volume. I want to start at low magnetic field over here and go uniformly increasing with distance to higher field over here. And then that's called a linear gradient right, in the magnetic field. And you just put all of these concentric cylinders one on top of the other and they sit here like this and you pulse those coils with the amplifiers. So the, the essential process to understand is that as I change my position in the magnet, I want to change the magnetic field as a function of position and that is going to be the way I encode position in my experiment. All right, so this is the, the essential thing of, of MR. If I change my position in X, say right to left of the patient, if we're looking from the patient's feet up towards their head, and this is their left arm and this is their right arm, as I move from the central part of the patient out to the outside, if the magnetic field in Z changes linearly, right, I've created an X gradient or a right-left gradient. And therefore, I have a nice change in field across the patient. My signal from this side of the patient will be coming in at a slightly higher frequency than the signal from this side of the patient. All right, so this, basically, I'm at a higher field here, so that 64 megahertz resonant frequency is 64 plus whatever I add by increasing the field over here. And then this is 64 minus whatever it is I've decreased the field over here. So now I have a whole spectrum of frequencies that are coming from my patient. And that's how I'm going to encode position. Is looking, is letting the signal evolve under those different field strengths and record it all. Um, well, we looked at the Z coil. And that was fairly straightforward, right? Let's look at how you make a, a Y gradient. So this is vertical. The floor is down here. Uh, ceiling is up here. If the patient's lying on their back, this is anterior, this is posterior, say. Now remember the shape of those coils to create the, the Y gradient uh, were these basically square things. And uh, if we pulse current in this top coil, in this direction here, using the right hand rule, so my current's going this way, right? I can put my thumb along the direction of the current with my right hand, which would be from here to here, right? And then my thumb's going along the direction of the current, my fingers wrap underneath, that's the direction of the magnetic field created by a current going along that wire. Right. You guys do this in high school or first year physics, right, where you, you know, right hand rule and you put a piece of wire in a magnetic field and then when you add current, what happens? When, if I have a magnet right here, static magnet, and I put wire across it and then I put voltage through the wire so I get a current, what does the wire do? It moves, right? It's Lenz's law, right? It goes boop. There's force on it, right? And that's because the current itself in the wire makes magnetic field, right? And so if you put your thumb along the direction of the current and you say, oh, I've got magnetic field going this way, that will push against whatever field is there and, and it'll move the wire. That is how a speaker works, right? You wrap wire around a magnet and then you pulse current in the wire and that force makes the wire move. And you attach that wire to a cone and then you make a speaker. Right? And that technology has been developed for the last, I don't know, 150 years or something. Although your generation, my kids' generation, nobody gave a damn about speakers. Right? For whatever reason. It just ended. When I was a kid, everybody knew about speakers and like you had to get the best speakers. You know, and they were always like could get electrostatic speakers, all these amazing speakers to make an amazing sound system. Now nobody gives a damn about sound. You just plug these things in your ears that are like tin buckets of sound. They're horrible, right? And I mean, they're kind of cool. You can wear them and everything, but 
you should you got you all should go one day i don't know if there's a, like an audio store anymore go to an audio store and listen to good sound actually being a tv store is where it'd be it would be like one of those uh you know large television systems they would have reasonable audio on there makes a difference to your life so anyway current goes here magnetic field goes here this thing is glued down to the cylinder like really well it's like glued right down because if you try and do this without gluing it down that wire just blows straight out of the scanner right there's a lot of forces right so we built these in my lab when i was young when i was in my 20s and uh, my some of my grad students built these coils using this design and we we hot glued them down to the the cylinder and everything we attached them up to the amplifiers of the scanner and we pulsed them and the damn thing just blew apart <laughs> it's like bam the wires all flapping around in the magnet it's like oh we need better glue right and so that's you learn that from the experience so now what we're going to do also is we're going to pulse uh current in this end of the coil in this direction right so it's in the same direction as this the current's going over the top in both cases. Use your thumb, you put it along the, the current direction. The magnetic field is going in the pink arrow. And so now I have a higher magnetic field in this space, right? And that will drop off as I move away from those current sources, right? So basically, I have high fields here, and then as I go down to the middle, I have lower field. Not only that, I'm going to put a mirror image of these coils down here and we'll pulse current this way, right? So it's actually going the same way. But when you use your right hand rule now, the, the pink arrows are going in the opposite direction, right? And so I'm, now I'm making magnetic Z field this way. So these two changes in the field will cancel out here and that's the, that is by definition y equals zero in our imaging experiment, right? It's where the gradient is null, right? If I go up here, the gradient gets, the field gets bigger. If I go down here, the field gets smaller. Okay. And then you rotate this 90 degrees, do it in X, and then we already looked at the Z coil. Okay, any questions about that, about gradients and such? This is what makes the noise. Has anyone had an MR? Put up your hand if you've had an MR scan or you've seen one happen. You've, you've seen, you've gone and seen it happen, right? So it makes a hell of a noise. It's like, brah, 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 brah. It's, a, it's a very loud device. In fact, you usually put earplugs in the patient. Like there's a drawer that has a bunch of really good earplugs in the drawer and you stick those in the patient to avoid, you know, giving them ringing ears if they get a lot of scanning, because this, these things get super loud. Because they are speakers, right? They're, they're, they're bad speakers, but they're speakers, right? And so if you're pulsing these coils off and on, they're gonna make a, a noise. Um, okay, any other questions about that? Nope. Nobody wants to know how hot they get, or. How often you have to change them. Okay. Um, so what I described before was this interesting experiment where from a quantum mechanical standpoint, you irradiate the sample and uh, you shut down the, ra the radiation that you're providing, which is the, at the resonant frequency. And when you shut it down, you get radiation back from the patient, right? And that emission from the patient is at the resonant frequency at 64 megahertz at 1.5 tesla. In order to describe that signal, uh, people use what's called, the, it's like a classical description of, of an angular momentum. And uh, we describe it with a magnetization vector m. All of this is a fiction. It's all a mathematical fiction in order to predict what's going to happen next in this experiment. And it does very well. It turns out that this thing M that we're going to talk about, which is the magnetization vector, 
is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian of this quantum mechanical uh, uh, system. Nobody has successfully described, in my experience, the transition from understanding this experiment from the quantum mechanical standpoint to this classical description using M, or, or the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Nobody's bothered to do that, as far as I can tell. So we're going to leave the quantum mechanical description behind, and we're going to use this description, which is the description of the magnetization vector, which works really well. Right? It, you, you very rarely make a mistake uh, using this description. If you get multiple nuclei involved with, with slight spectral shifts and interactions and things like that between nuclei, then this breaks apart. But most of the time we're just watering or we're just imaging water with and we don't really care about the interaction of those protons with other protons other than other water protons. This works just fine. So the first order of business is the fact that there is a resonant frequency, and that it's called the Larmor frequency. And the Larmor frequency is linearly proportional to the applied field strength on our sample or our patient. So this is 1.5 Tesla in most cases, the B naught value, which is the magnetic field. And this frequency here in Hertz is 64 megahertz. Gamma is a number that is specific for each nucleon. So for protons, gamma, the relationship between the applied magnetic field and the, free, and the resonant frequency is 42.58 megahertz per Tesla. Okay, so that's the number you have to remember is that if I have one Tesla magnet, I better have all my RF tuned to 42.58 megahertz. Right? If I have a two Tesla magnet, it's 84 or 80, you know, 5 megahertz. Um, as we increase the magnetic field by putting more current in those coils, right, to, to just ramp up the magnetic field, we operate at higher and higher frequencies, right? So at 10 Tesla, we're all already up at 400 megahertz, which is a high frequency, right? Does, does anyone know where you, it, radio frequency waves turn into microwaves? At what frequency? So we go like radio frequency is 40 megahertz is a radio frequency wave. And then 400 megahertz, that's still a radio frequency wave, right? What about, let's go up to a gigahertz. Is that a radio frequency wave? It's still the same stuff, right? It's still a radio frequency wave, but it's usually called a microwave up there because it's like the wavelength is now down around a centimeter. And that's what, in your microwave, makes the water vibrate and heats it up. Okay. So down at 40 megahertz, we don't have to worry about that mode of vibrating water too much, thankfully. All right, so we can, we can image the patient with radio frequency. Um, so in a, stagnet, a static magnetic field, let me see what's coming next, yeah. At a static magnetic field of 1.5 Tesla, when we put the sample in the static magnetic field, after a certain time, which is usually a couple of seconds, there will be uh, a magnetization vector created in that sample. We'll call that M0. It has a, a height or amplitude that is proportional to the applied magnetic field. Um, and that magnetization vector is in the Z direction. It's along the direction of the applied magnetic field. That defines the Z direction. Right? X and Y are not defined until you put RF energy into the system, and that, that then defines what X and Y are. It's the, the phase of that RF energy is going to define it. So when we apply a pulse, say a one millisecond radio frequency pulse at the resonant frequency, um, the magnetization vector tips away from the Z direction, and it tips down towards what's called the transverse plane, or the XY plane. And the amount that it tips is proportional to both the amplitude and the duration of this radio frequency. Okay. And so if I double the amplitude of my pulse, I will get a tip angle that is double 
the tip angle, right? We can set the duration and the amplitude to create what's called a 90 degree RF pulse. And a 90 degree pulse will tip the magnetization from the Z direction down into the transverse plane. And now I have X and Y defined. It's been defined by the existence of this pulse. It's my zero time is when the pulse starts. And I have magnetization vector in the XY plane. When I shut off my radio frequency, it is the precession of that magnetization vector in the XY plane at 64 megahertz that we model as the signal that we measure with our RF coils, our receiver coils. So the magnetization vector is in the transverse plane. It's processing at 64 megahertz at 1.5 T. I put a receiver coil up to the sample, and I can generate a signal in my coil from that magnetization vector processing and my received signal is 64 megahertz. If I double the amplitude of this pulse, I will create a 180 degree RF pulse, which is called an inversion pulse, because it takes the magnetization vector from being in the positive Z direction, it essentially makes it process through 180 degrees, and so now it's magnetization in the negative Z direction. There is no magnetization in the XY plane at this point. There is no precession of that magnetization in the XY plane. It's all in the Z negative Z direction. So I don't see a signal. All right, so double that. If I have a 90 degree pulse where I get my maximum signal, if I double that pulse, I will get no signal because the magnetization vector went through the transverse plane and went all the way to Z. It will, over time, recover back to its original starting configuration, which is here. And we'll look at that in a second. So herein lies the, I don't know, like paradox of the quantum mechanical description and the magnetization vector description. The magnetization vector description, if I have a 90 degree pulse, I put the magnetization in the transverse plane, I get signal because it processes. I double that pulse, I get no signal. Okay, from the magnetization vector, that makes sense. From a quantum mechanical description, I don't really understand. <coughs> I irradiate the sample, I get signal back, I now double the amount of RF energy I put into the sample, and I get no signal. That's kind of odd. <laughs> right? Nobody to, nobody in my experience, has explained that very well, like how that happens from a quantum mechanical standpoint. So we'll forget about the quantum mechanics and we'll look at the magnetization vector because it's trivial in that case. Although it's a, it's just a mathematical uh, art of, uh, description. So what we're going to look at right now is called T1 recovery, and it is the rate at which the magnetization vector goes from zero back to its equilibrium value. Okay. If I'm sitting there, if my sample is in the magnet for a minute, the magnetization vector amplitude does not change anymore. It just sits there in a steady state. Right? And that steady state is defined or dependent on the amplitude of the static magnetic field. If I apply a 90 degree pulse such that there is now, at, immediately after that pulse, no magnetization in the z direction, I will recover towards the equilibrium value with some kind of time constant recovery here. Another way to look at this is instead of saying I do a 90 degree pulse here, we could say, forget about the RF pulse, I just put the sample in the magnet at this time. There is no magnetization vector when it's outside the magnet, I put it in the magnet, and then the magnetization increases over time. Right? This rate of increase is called uh, T1, and you can model it with a very simple exponential uh, here. So where it's the baseline value that it will achieve times 1 minus e to the negative t over t1. And so that's a time constant. It's a simple, a, uh, excuse me, a simple single exponential time constant. 
that drives it back to its equilibrium value. Um, in tissue, let's say liver or muscle, this time constant is around a half a second. Right? It's good that it's not, you know, 30 seconds. It would take a long time to, to get a magnetization vector back after you were trying to image with it. A half a second, that's pretty good. We can take some signal, we wait around for a second, and we get almost all of our magnetization vector back to do the next thing. So that's just an accident of physics and the universe that, that this thing is 500 milliseconds as opposed to like 50 seconds. Okay. Interestingly, when we tip the magnetization vector down into the transverse plane, it starts processing in the transverse plane. That precession is occurring at the resonant frequency, but the amplitude of the vector in the transverse plane is being reduced over time. There's a natural reduction in uh, the transverse magnetization vector, which is called T2 relaxation, which is this envelope here. And so we would see, you know, if I put a receiver coil right here, we would see an oscillating voltage through that receiver coil at 64 megahertz. That's what that frequency is. And the amplitude of the signal would decrease over time. And this turns out, you can't describe this really. Uh, in a perfectly uniform magnetic field, there is no way to describe T2 relaxation through this classical description of magnetization vector. Like, why does the magnetization vector decay with this time constant? It turns out it's the... the Spin, the coherence of neighboring spins and the loss of that coherence is what creates this decay of signal. Right? So you have to go back to quantum mechanics, but we're not going there. So you have to take it on faith that this, you just measure the decay of this signal, and uh, that decay is usually in you know, soft tissue like liver, muscle, blood, things like that. That decay constant is around... 50 to 150 milliseconds, something like that. And so the signal is lost after a few hundred milliseconds. So if we're going to do any imaging by measuring signal from the patient, we have to get it all done inside here, inside 150 milliseconds, right, or less, actually. Usually with tens of milliseconds to get the signal that we want. If I have a collection of magnetization vectors, which you can imagine where we're going. An MR image is a set of voxels, and inside each voxel, our image will be a representation of the magnetization vector in that voxel. That's what the image is going to be. And so there'll be an amplitude of the magnetization vector, how big it is. We'll also have a phase, like where it is in the transverse plane. And we can even measure its decay constant. If I have a lot of magnetization vectors in my patient and they happen to be in slightly different magnetic fields, that will cause a reduction in the total signal, which is much quicker than the reduction if everybody was in exactly the same field. So we have to get our business done even earlier than this T2 decay and this is called T2 star, which is the effective decay of the signal, given the fact that these magnetization vectors will be in slightly different magnetic fields. So that's called T2 decay. So we have T1 recovery, and that is dependent on the type of tissue you're in. Uh, and we have T2 decay. All right, those two parameters are very important for magnetic resonance imaging because you can achieve image contrast, brightness, difference in brightness in the picture based on T1 and T2. So it's not just an intensity, not just how much it and not is there, it's also how quickly does it decay, how quickly does it recover. Right? That's going to be brightness. <clears throat> 
we can use a really cool mechanism called the spin echo in order to increase the amount of time we have to collect our signal. If we tip the magnetization vector into the transverse plane and after some time delta t, different magnetization vectors have evolved to different phases in the transverse plane because they're precessing at slightly different frequencies. We see a, a rapid decay of the signal. And so here, our a collection of magnetization vectors will be at different phases. We'll have a decay of the signal. We can apply another radio frequency pulse, which effectively takes these magnetization vectors that were in this position in the transverse plane and flips them 180 degrees, just like you would do a pancake on a pan. Whoop. You make that geometric change. Just whoop, flip it around one axis. So now the magnetization vectors are over here, and it turns out after an equal amount of time has passed, they all come back together. Right? Their phase evolution brings them back together. And so you see a peak again in the signal from the entire sample. And that peak is called a spin echo. And the amplitude of the signal at the point of that peak will be proportional to T2, not T2 star. Because right? it, it eradicates the effect of different magnetic fields. And all you have left is the intrinsic decay of the magnetization. And so that's called a spin echo, and that's one of the earliest types of image that was created is a spin echo image. <clears throat> this is the first pulse sequence that you've been exposed to. And this is a very simple pulse sequence. It has two RF pulses versus time. So this is amplitude here versus time. And so the radio frequency energy coming out uh, changes its amplitude in this envelope to make a 90 degree pulse. After that 90 degree pulse, we will see signal coming from the sample. That signal will decay with an envelope that is effectively T2 star. And this envelope is usually tens of milliseconds, right? depending on the magnetic field. So we run out of signal. There's no signal left here. However, we apply another RF pulse. It's the 180-degree refocusing pulse. That occurs here. And then we see at this time, which is twice, so this is TE by 2, this is TE, we see a spin echo occur. And it is this signal that is often used to make the picture. Right? It's when this signal comes back into phase and we see that spin echo. This was used you know, before MR imaging to bring signal back from samples that were in magnetic fields that were not uniform. You, you would prefer, if you're doing an NMR spectroscopy experiment, to have your sample in a very uniform field. If you can't achieve that, you can do a spin echo to, to get signal back. So as you can expect, we're going to generate image contrast, differences in image brightness, based on the differences in these relaxation parameters, or this T1 recovery and T2 decay. They're often called relaxation parameters as well. Um, so here's if tissue has long T1, which say cerebral spinal fluid can have a long T1. It's pure water. It's a very, very pure water. So it will take a long time to come to equilibrium. That's what the recovery will look like. Short T1, say fat, has short T1, or if you put in an MR contrast agent, like gadolinium, that will reduce the T1 and it makes stuff really bright because it comes back to its magnetization or its equilibrium value very quickly. And so that makes the T1 short and it gets bright quicker. So we'll see how we use this difference in T1 to make image contrast in the next lecture. Water, or a cerebral spinal fluid, or something that's very pure water, will have a long T2. So it, the signal will last for a long time in the transverse plane. Uh, and then things that have very uh, non-pure uh, water-like uh, substructure, so something like muscle or, or uh, cortical bone or something like that, has very short T2.
And so the signal decays away quite quickly compared to water. So in the image, it will appear dark or darker than the long T2 stuff. So those are the, primarily the, the contrast mechanisms used. Remember, T2 is about 50 milliseconds. T1 is about 500 milliseconds. Right? So these two curves don't have the same time scale. This one has been shortened by a factor of 10. Let's see what we have. Okay, so this is our full-on pulse sequence, but we won't do that until next lecture. Um, okay, but as you can see, we have the RF line that we just looked at. This is time and amplitude. And then this is the signal line, or what we're seeing in our coil. And this is the echo after the first 90 degree pulse, it decays away. Apply a spin echo pulse, refocusing pulse, and then we get a spin echo out here. We want to use this signal to use the magnetic field gradients to make the picture. Okay, we'll, and we'll study these magnetic field gradients in the next lecture. Okay, so today... Um, so it's now 10.30, so we'll start our uh, paper review. And who's, who's giving the paper today? Okay, terrific. Um, did you email it to me? Oh, you did? Okay, great. Let me, uh, let me just...